Hi, well, good evening, ladies. It is great to be back together again this evening. How are we all doing tonight? I think that we in the Painter House are actually doing pretty well tonight. Um, Justin and Anna are back on their virtual online schooling. Um, so it's nice to be back to a schedule here in the Painter House. I love that. Um, Burks, you keep asking about Burks, my dog. He is, I think, back to himself again. And how I know this is he's back on his mission to steal all the food that he can possibly find. Um, and he's even learned how to open the bread drawer, which has a, a sliding top on it as well. So um, he's definitely back to himself. And in a related note, um, we're out of bread. But I'll work on that when I get off um, of this Zoom. Anyhow, um, I like normal. Um, normal is good for me. I like to know what I can expect, even if it's expecting my dog's going to steal something off the counter. I like normal and knowing what I can expect. Um, and I love good news sharing. I know we haven't done it in a long time, but sometimes my soul just needs to hear the good news of God. You know, just what is God doing throughout the city of Cleveland? What is God doing in the lives and the hearts of people that I love? And it's just so encouraging to hear everything that you all shared tonight. And so many of those things are answered prayers. Um, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, for sharing. Um, and I hope that you're encouraged as well from hearing all of the good news. So as we continue now, what is this month seven of the pandemic and everything else that 2020 has thrown at us? Um, a lot of us, I think, are tired. Um, a lot of us are struggling. A lot of us are hurting. A lot of us are discouraged. A lot of us are weary. Um, a few weeks ago, you know, as sisters, we sat and we talked about uh, Matthew 11 and about how we're doing in our relationship and our walk with God. Um, and I was really saddened to hear so many of you even share that within your relationship, your walk with God, you're feeling weary. Um, I'm grateful we had the opportunity to talk about it and get to get it out of our hearts, but it was sad to hear. And obviously, God doesn't want us to be weary. God doesn't want us to be burdened. Um, certainly not in our walk with him or in life in general. He cares deeply and passionately about each and every one of us. And then that's actually what I want to talk about tonight. You know, each of us approach our walk with God or our, our view, our opinion of God a little bit differently. You know, we all have our own baggage. We all have our own preconceived ideas. And we come into this relationship um, maybe with a, a challenging personal experience or even a jaded view of the world. And it colors our view of God. We could each characterize God differently based on our experiences and our histories. Who is he? And what is he like? But God actually tells us himself. Yes, through the entire Bible, through all of scripture, God reveals himself to us. But even very specifically, God describes his character to us. And so tonight, what we're going to talk about comes from the book of Exodus. Um, Exodus chapter 34 in verse 5. And this is happening after Moses has asked God to see his glory. And so God has said, yes, I will pass in front of you. I will let you see my glory and I will tell you who I am. And this is what he says in Exodus 34 verse five. It says, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And as he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And of all the words that God could choose to use to describe himself, the very first word that God chooses is compassionate. Maybe that's not the first thing that you think of about God, but that's how God wants to be known. That's the essence of his character. The word that he uses here for compassionate in Hebrew is rachem, 
And it's related to the Hebrew word, obviously, for compassion, which is rachamim. And those two words are also very closely related to the Hebrew word rechem. And that word actually means womb. So we have compassion, compassionate, and womb, like the womb of a pregnant woman, are all very intertwined. And the reason for that is because the Bible wants us to know that compassion is centered into a person's core. It's part of the innermost part of who we are. And I love that it uses the word womb as well, because when you think about a womb, you think about that tender image of a woman, a woman who's just given birth to her children, a woman who is caring very deeply and emotionally for her vulnerable infant. And God tells us that is first and foremost who he is. He is compassionate. Other places in scripture, he repeats this idea that he's compassionate. And just to name a few of my favorites, Psalm 103, verse 13, says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And again, I love the imagery, the imagery of a, of a father, of a strong and loving father, tenderly and consistently, protectively taking care of his children. That's how God views himself in relation to us. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, it says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Again, the imagery of God loving us like a mother, the tenderness, the complete care, the nurturing that a nursing mother has on her infant. And finally, Jeremiah 31 verse 3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. And there's so many, many more scriptures. I just picked a few just to illustrate God at his core is compassion. The scriptures tell us that he's filled with it, that it's great, that his compassion is deep, and that it's everlasting. And one of my favorite stories about God and his compassion is found at the very beginning of scripture. So you all know in Genesis 1 and 2, God creates the world, right? And it's perfect. And it's he says it's good. It's very good. And then Genesis 3 happens, right? We started off with very good and God leaves his people and his creation alone. And what happens in Genesis 3? Well, Adam and Eve sin and they eat the forbidden fruit. And then they, they realize they're naked and they're ashamed and they make some clothes for themselves. And then God comes into the garden to have some fellowship with them and they hide from him again because they're ashamed and God's not happy and God doles out an intense punishment to each one who was in the garden the man the woman the serpent they're all punished but just before God kicks them out of the garden kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden forever after the punishment and before they're kicked out forever God is compassion God remembers they were ashamed because they were naked and he makes them clothes. And he doesn't even just send them out of the garden with the clothes that they made, the, the cheap clothes of leaves and whatever they could sew together in the garden. God makes them clothes of animal skin. He gives them what they want and even better than what they could come up with on their own. And that's the compassion of God. At the very beginning of scripture, the compassion of the God that we serve. And even in the story that we started with tonight, the story of Moses on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments and God reveals himself to Moses up there on Mount Sinai, this is a supreme act of compassion as well. You know, God had just given the Ten Commandments to the Israelites, but while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, the Israelites were at the bottom of the mountain in the desert um, under the direction of Moses' brother Aaron, worshiping a golden cow. They had just been led out of Egypt. They just crossed the Red Sea. They'd just been given the Ten Commandments. They just promised to follow God. 
and they're bowing down and worshiping, literally worshiping a golden cow. Moses throws down the Ten Commandments in a fit of rage, but God doesn't wipe out his people, and he doesn't turn his back on his people, and he doesn't leave Moses. God forgives, and he rewrites the stone tablets. And he lets Moses see his glory. That's the compassion of our God. And throughout the rest of the Bible, we find example after example of God's compassion on his people, climaxing in the life of Jesus himself, of sending Jesus from heaven to earth for us, and then ultimately sending Jesus to the cross for our sins. The compassion of God. And Jesus, during his time on earth, he embraced his father's compassion as well. And when talking about Jesus' compassion, every time in scripture that it talks about Jesus saw someone and had compassion on them, it follows with the word and or the word so. Jesus had compassion on them, and so he cared for the sick. He touched the outcast. He touched the leper. He raised the dead. Jesus, in his compassion, acted. Further with his compassion, Jesus himself, in Matthew 23, when he's praying about Jerusalem, Jesus himself compares himself to a mother hen gathering her chicks in his embrace. Again, the tenderness, the protection, the compassion, the care that our Lord has. For us. And then the, his death itself on the cross. And so tonight we're going to spend a few minutes talking about um, compassion and talking about one of Jesus' parables that really illustrates compassion. So if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 10. And there are so many stories and parables of Jesus that illustrate his compassion. Um, I've just chosen this one tonight to walk through, um, and we could pick so many things out of this story that we're going to talk tonight, but we're just going to focus on compassion. So Luke chapter 10, verse 25, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. Again, there's so many wonderful things we can take from this passage, so many lessons to learn, but we're just going to focus on compassion tonight. And what prompts this whole interaction between Jesus and this lawyer um, is the lawyer's trying to test Jesus. The lawyer wants to know, what is the bare minimum I need to do to make it into heaven? Where's the line? Help me get just to the other side of the line. And in response, Jesus tells this parable. And as we see here, robbers come, they attack a man, he is beaten, he is robbed, and he is left for dead. And in verse 31, it says a priest happened to be going down the same road 
When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32, so too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And a Levite is a special kind of priest in the Jewish uh, tradition. So we've got a priest and a special grouping of priests that pass by this man. And all they do is pass by on the other side. But verse 33, but a Samaritan, not necessarily a priest, not necessarily a religious person, a Jew for sure, but not a priest. When a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was and he saw him, he took pity on him. And so point number one about compassion is compassionate people are willing to get involved. Compassionate people are willing to get involved. You know, I have had a lot of emotions in 2020. I'm sure that you have too. In many senses, it's been a roller coaster, right? We started off pretty well. Actually, I didn't start off well. My dog was sick. I came home to a sick dog on New Year's Day. But it mostly started off well. And then it got bad. And then it got pretty good. And then it got really bad. And you can draw your own roller coaster for yourself. Um, it's been an interesting year. But as we begin, to talk tonight about compassion, I think it's important that we start by defining it. Because honestly, for me, I've had the wrong definition of compassion, probably through most of my life, but definitely through this year. You know, compassion is defined as an understanding of another's pain and the desire to somehow mitigate that pain, right? It's the desire, it's the understanding of another's pain and the desire to somehow mitigate that pain. And I think for me, how often I have stopped short after the first part of that definition, an understanding of another's pain. And I have felt badly for so many people in so many situations, and yet I've stopped. That's not the definition of compassion. That's the definition maybe of sympathy. Sympathy is feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune. I definitely have felt a lot of pity. Empathy, the ability to relate to another's pain. So I think more often I felt empathy and sympathy. But the important part of compassion is that it motivates us uh, to go out of our way to help people. It's love in action. It's not just a feeling. It's an action. God's compassion was active in the examples that we started with, right? God felt for his people. They were ashamed. They were naked. He made them close. His people end up in Egypt, and he feels bad for his oppressed people, and he, he delivers them out of Egypt. Feels bad, sees the oppression, delivers them, rescues them. His people are lost throughout all of the Old Testament. They keep finding themselves lost. And God continues to send prophets to pursue them and to rescue them. And then for us who are eternally lost, God sends Jesus to help us. God sees the need. God sees the pain. He sees the hurt. And he enacts an action. <coughs> God's compassion always involves action. So too does the Samaritan's compassion. He didn't just see the man and perhaps feel badly for him, he helped him, he acted. You know, the scripture says he bandaged his wounds. He literally got his hands dirty, right? The man was beaten and bloody, and he bandaged his wounds. Today, we use all kinds of protection in those kind of situations when we come in contact with, he probably didn't have any of that, but he still put himself in that situation to take care of the man's wounds. He poured his own oil and wine on the man. He put the man on his own donkey. And even thinking about that, you've got a man who's practically half dead. He can't help himself to get on the donkey. Again, the Samaritan probably gets himself covered with mud and with blood and who knows what else oozing out of the man who was beaten. He took him, he took care of him as he hoisted him on the donkey. Then he took him to an inn and took care of him there. And the Greek words here is it talks about him going to the inn and taking care of him. It implies more than just he took care of him. The words talk about offering the kind of care and devotion that a mother or a nurse 
would provide for her children. That's the kind of care that the Samaritan man took on the man who had been beaten. I'm sure he lost sleep during that night as he watched over him. He paid the innkeeper to look after him. You know, paid for a stranger out of his own pocket and then returned to pay any extra expense that the man would have occurred. He was willing to even come back and do more. The Samaritan man was willing to get involved. You know, so often we can feel badly for people who have fallen on hard times. Our heart goes out to them. We may even have good intentions to help them, but our sympathetic feelings and our good intentions aren't enough. The Samaritan's intentions didn't save the man. His actions did. And as I was researching for this tonight, I came across a quote from one of my favorite spiritual authors. His name's Ravi Zacharias. And he says, if you're not motivated to do something, you don't have compassion. You're, you have moralizing. How easy it would have been for the Samaritan man to look at the man, shake his head, acknowledge the wrong that the robbers had done to him and that had beaten him and stolen his belongings and left him naked and then just moved on. Imagine, he could just stand there and look at the man and think, this is wrong. We need some more security on this road from Jerusalem. Some things like this should never happen again. These men should be found. These men should be punished. Well, that's moralizing. And that's true. But it doesn't help. Compassion gets involved. <coughs> Excuse me. And compassion can be challenging. But it is so necessary. I think, sisters, we do a great job of acting in compassion here in the Cleveland Church. I really want to lift you up. Um, for all that you've done in acting in compassion over the years that we've been here, I've seen some amazing acts of compassion. I think about, I don't know if it was a year ago, I've lost track of time at this point with COVID. So maybe it was two years ago. I remember on a Sunday morning getting a call from Sherry Mersek saying, we're gonna be really late for church today. Our friend's basement flooded and we're gonna go bail it out and try to dry it out for them. That is a supreme act of compassion. Doubling down on the Mersex, I think of them last year and realizing that a brother was in great need and they gave the brother their car. Not that they had an extra car laying around, but they gave the brother their car, even during a time when Corey's job wasn't secured. The compassion that they had on a brother. I think of Laura Bartell giving food and products out of the wealth that she has from her extreme couponing storeroom. And she's constantly giving to people as she hears of needs. I think of Barb Hawkinson continually calling me and saying, who can I encourage? Who needs some help in the church? I think about the Abigail women who, when Rosie Sadler was sick, perpetually went over and cleaned her house, even though her own children were living there, to take care of her. Such compassion in our church. The different people who bring bags of groceries or leftovers to give to the single brothers because they know they have a need. The meals that have been delivered all over the church to people who are hurting or sick or financially in need. The secret checks that have been mailed throughout the city as well for those who are financially in need. People who have mowed each other's lawns and shoveled each other's snow. <coughs> we do a great job of showing compassion. Sometimes though, I think we're so overwhelmed, we don't even know where to begin to show compassion. And I know I have felt some of that this year. There are so many needs and so much going on and so much big going on. I don't even know where to begin to help. And I can feel helpless. But even though, even then, many of us respond in compassion. I think of all the cards that have been sent around to the brothers and sisters in the congregation, the phone calls, the prayers. You know, I think death is particularly difficult when someone has passed to know what to do and to know what to say, and especially during COVID. I think that's very challenging. I was talking with um, Sharnetta last week, and as you know, Sharnetta unexpectedly lost her brother two weeks ago, and I was asking her how she's doing and what's been helping her along, and she said, you know, one of the 
the best things has been Celine coming to her house. And she said, sometimes they talk on and on for hours, and sometimes they cry, and sometimes they just sit in silence. And that's enough. And I think sometimes when we feel helpless, that's enough just to be, just to be present. Um, not to shoot a quick text, but just to actually physically be present with each other and show our true and deep love and compassion that we have for each other. I was really moved by that, Celine. So why then are there times that we don't get involved? Because I think there are some times for myself as well, and we just don't get involved. Well, here's another quote that I found while I was studying out compassion. This is from Rick Warren. And he says, when we live a lifestyle of avoidance, we try to keep all of our relationships superficial. If we can keep everyone at arm's length, we can pretend we don't see their pain and their needs. If we don't get involved, we can avoid getting hurt or inconvenienced. Okay, that's really direct. And we're not going to talk about that tonight. But just make sure there's not a heart check in there for you tonight. Are your relationships superficial? Are you fully embracing people? Or do you keep them at an arm's length? So we're going to move on. Point number two, compassion isn't always convenient. Have you ever noticed that? The things that seem to require the most compassion often come at the most inconvenient of times, right? You know, I think about our children. The children never get sick when it's a good time for us to take the day off, do they? No, they get sick when there's a big meeting or when we're behind on a big project. It's never convenient to stop and have compassion and take care of our children. You know, one of my most memorable times of Anna, sorry, Anna, I know you're listening to this. Forgot to ask if I could share this story. But one of my most memorable times of Anna, she was really little and we were about ready to go on a vacation. And Anna wasn't quite acting like herself. So we got all packed for vacation, packed up the car, and on our way out of town, we stopped at the doctor's office just to make sure everything was okay. And as soon as I walked in the door of the doctor's office, Anna threw up all over everything. All over me, my hair, in my shirt, all over the carpet of the lobby of the doctor's office, everywhere. So I was glad that we stopped at the doctor's office before we headed out of town. But then we headed back to our house so everyone could have a shower and we could do some more laundry and we could repack the clothes. It wasn't convenient, but that was my baby. And of course we were gonna stop and take care of Anna. You know, I think about the death of a loved one. Death never comes at a convenient time, does it? We always have to rearrange our schedule for a death. The loss of a job, that's never convenient as well. And for many of us, that's coming in a season when we're already struggling paycheck to paycheck. Losing jobs are never convenient. Your friend's crisis, whatever it is, it's never convenient. Yet we do drop everything for those we love, even in the times of inconvenience. You know, it wasn't convenient for the Samaritan either. He wasn't traveling this road for fun. He was out there for a reason. He was headed somewhere, but he stopped. He got dirty. He took his time. He, he uh, I'm sorry, he took time out of his schedule, at least a whole night. And he took precious money out of his own pocket to take care of the man. Compassion isn't convenient. Sometimes, though, I don't know about you, sometimes for me, to make myself feel better about my lack of convenience, I can go back to sympathy or empathy or even jump to some justifications as to why I don't need to get involved and actually show compassion. Sometimes I can look at a situation and I can become critical or judgmental or even blaming the person that got themselves into a situation that needs compassion. Sometimes we can go back to some self-preserving behaviors or default, default to some other coping mechanisms where we don't have to get involved when it isn't convenient. Sometimes we give in to comparing crises, minimizing, diminishing, trivializing others' needs because it makes us feel better about not giving in to the inconvenience and actually showing compassion. 
<coughs> excuse me, sisters, let's not give in when compassion is inconvenient. It wasn't convenient for Jesus to show compassion when he went to the cross. Let us dig deep and show compassion when it's needed. And finally, point number three, compassion isn't always reciprocated. This is a hard one. Many of us like justice, don't we? We like fairness. We like equality. If I take care of you, then you'll take care of me. But compassion isn't contingent on reciprocity. God's compassion, Jesus' compassion, isn't always reciprocated. You know, I appreciated that Jewel started off in Romans 5, going just a bit further than what she read in our welcome tonight. Romans 5, verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And sadly, many people still don't care. Jesus went to the cross knowing that his compassion would not be completely reciprocated. And yet he went. The Samaritan didn't know anything about the man he was helping. He didn't know if the man would be grateful. He didn't know if the man would be able to pay him back. He didn't even know if the man would hate him because he's a Samaritan. He just knew that the man needed help. And I think most of us aren't held back by our desire to financially be paid back. I think we have some incredibly giving, generous folks in our church. Most of us can get past that and generously offer of our wallets to each other. But many of us can be held back because we are relationally afraid. We are relationally scarred. And we know that people need us to initiate. They need us to call. They need us to come. They need us to share our heart with them. They need us to spend time together. But if I fill your emotional cup with compassion, what will happen if you don't fill mine? And that's where I think the sting of Rick Warren's quote comes in. When our fear of not being reciprocated overtakes our compassion, we can end up with some superficial relationships. Sisters, God is a God of compassion. It's the very first word that he chooses to describe himself. He continually has an intense love for us, a love that drives him to action. And as his children who reflect his glory, we too need to be filled with compassion. So often it doesn't come easy. And it isn't convenient. And its lack of reciprocity can hurt our hearts. But God has called us to a life of compassion. I appreciate the verse in Colossians 3, verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's not a natural thing necessarily. It takes thought and intentionality to be compassionate. And clothing ourselves with compassion is as deliberate as putting our pants on in the morning. It's a choice. It's a decision. This is a time of great need for so many of us. This is an unprecedented time of stress and anxiety in our world, in our country, in our city here in Cleveland. People have lost jobs all over the place and are hurting. People are changing jobs and are hurting. And even those who haven't lost jobs, the new normal is still hard. The conversation last week with Alberta, she was sharing that, yeah, she's able to go back in the office, but it's so different. There isn't the interaction with coworkers. There isn't that fun in the atmosphere. Maybe fun isn't the word you'd use to describe for your work, but that enthusiasm that we're all here together, the camaraderie in the atmosphere in the office. It's so different and that can be so painful. So many of us are feeling tension and fear, a COVID fear. For the online learners, as Sherry was sharing, it is a hard time for teachers learning to teach in a virtual world. And for our students, learning to learn in a virtual world. And for the parents, learning to help navigate for the students, 
and the teachers in the virtual world, it's hard. There's a lot of death and there's a lot of illness. This is a hard time. Sisters, take the time to notice those around you and what's going on with them. Take the time to notice who's hurting. Don't just walk past on the other side. And then commit, as you love like Jesus, to sacrifice your time, inconvenient though it may be, and your resources that you have, that you can show true biblical compassion on each other. Amen.